In the haunting interplay between devotion and darkness, killer cults emerge as chilling footnotes in the annals of human history. These stories are not mere tales of violence, but profound reflections on the magnetic pull of charisma and the depths to which it can drag the human soul. As we prepare to unveil the mysteries of the Blackburn cult and the order of the Solar Temple, we tread the delicate boundary between faith and fanaticism, exploring how the quest for spiritual enlightenment can veer into the abyss of madness. These narratives challenge us to ponder the darker aspects of our search for meaning, reminding us that in the pursuit of the divine, we must beware the shadows that lurk behind the light of conviction. Join us on a journey into the heart of these enigmatic sagas, where belief transforms into obsession and salvation dissolves into tragedy. In the early 1920s, the city of Los Angeles became the unlikely stage for a tale of mysticism, manipulation, and mystery that still haunts the annals of American true crime. At the heart of this story was May Otis Blackburn, a woman who, alongside her daughter Ruth, founded a religious group known as the Cult of the Great Eleven, or the Blackburn Cult. May claimed to communicate directly with angels who provided her with divine revelations meant to save the world. These messages were to be compiled into a series of books, The Great Sixth Seal, which May asserted would contain the knowledge to unlock the riches of the universe and bring about a new era of enlightenment. The Blackburn cult quickly attracted followers, drawn in by May's charismatic leadership and promises of spiritual salvation and earthly wealth. Followers were required to show their devotion through financial contributions, handing over their life savings and property to the cause. The cult's operations were based in the Simi Valley, where May planned to build a temple of love and prepare for the apocalypse she claimed was imminent. As the ranks of the Blackburn cult swelled, so too did the peculiarity of its practices. May envisioned herself seated upon a majestic throne, ruling over the remnants of a world reborn from Apocalypse's ashes. Her commands grew increasingly bizarre, from elaborate rituals to the construction of an ark, designed to weather the cataclysm of the end times. Yet, beneath this facade of eccentric devotion, a more nefarious undertow pulled at the foundations of the cult. Accusations of exploitation and mental coercion surfaced, painting a grim picture of manipulation masked as spiritual guidance. Even more disturbing were the whispers of unexplained deaths among the faithful, a chilling pattern that suggested these were not mere tragedies, but perhaps sacrifices to a darker purpose. Beneath the surface of these oddities lay darker secrets, the cult was accused of exploitation, brainwashing, and even more sinister activities as allegations began to surface, including the mysterious deaths of several members. One particularly harrowing tale involved the 1925 disappearance of a cult member, believed to be a sacrifice demanded by the angels with whom May communicated. This, combined with the sudden unexplained deaths of others in the cult, began to draw the attention of law enforcement and the media, casting a shadow over the cult's activities and leading to increasing scrutiny. Despite the growing controversies, May Otis Blackburn's grip on her followers remained strong, her promises of salvation and power keeping them bound to her side. Yet, as the authorities began to delve deeper into the cult's practices, the facade of divine guidance would soon crumble, revealing the chilling truth behind the cult of the Great Eleven. As the veil of secrecy surrounding the Blackburn cult began to fray, a chilling narrative unfolded, pieced together from the whispered accounts of those who had escaped its grasp. The investigation deepened drawing back the curtain on a world where devotion was twisted into something unrecognisable, 
and the line between faith and madness blurred. Among the revelations, the tale of Willow Road stood out, a stark, haunting reminder of the peril that lay in blind allegiance. In the year 1924, the young Willa succumbed to illness, a plight that would normally summon the aid of medicine. Yet in the world May Blackburn had crafted, traditional healing was forsaken for prayers and rituals. Claiming direct counsel with the celestial, May convinced Willa's devout parents that their daughter's salvation lay not in the hands of doctors, but in the esoteric rites she prescribed. As Willa's light dimmed, her fate was sealed not with a solemn farewell, but with a ritual that veiled a darker intent. Upon Willa's death, her body was not granted the peace of the grave, but was instead enshrined in a makeshift sarcophagus, a chilling testament to May's delusions. This tomb, filled with spices and ice, was said to be a cradle awaiting resurrection, bound by a celestial sign that never came. When the authorities discovered Willa's preserved remains years later, in 1929, the ghastly sight laid bare the grim consequences of May's influence. Her promises of life beyond death revealed as nothing more than a macabre fantasy. The trial that ensued was a spectacle, replete with tales of divine visions and prophesied cataclysms, capturing the public's imagination and horror in equal measure. Throughout the proceedings, May Blackburn remained defiant, cloaked in the mantle of her supposed divine mission, even as the evidence mounted against her. Her proclamations of persecution sought to echo the trials of prophets of old, yet the shadow of manipulation and deceit loomed large. In a verdict that sent ripples of disbelief through the courtroom, May emerged unscathed, acquitted of all charges, leaving in her wake a trail of disillusioned followers and shattered lives. The aftermath of the cult of the Great Eleven left a complex legacy, weaving together themes of faith, manipulation, and the search for meaning in the modern world. The Blackburn cult, for all its eccentricities and dark practices, was a manifestation of a perennial human desire, the longing for understanding and salvation, whether spiritual or earthly. May Otis Blackburn's ability to captivate and control her followers speaks to the power of charisma and the vulnerability of those seeking guidance. The cult's dissolution did little to provide closure for its victims or clarity on the enigmatic figure of May herself. She lived out her days in relative obscurity, her name forever tied to one of the most bizarre chapters in the history of American religious movements. The properties once intended for the cult's grandiose projects were abandoned, serving as silent witnesses to the human cost of May's visions. Reflecting on the story of the cult of the Great Eleven invites a broader contemplation of the nature of belief systems and the responsibilities of those who claim to wield spiritual authority. It underscores the dangers inherent in unconditional faith placed in fallible leaders and the importance of skepticism and accountability in guarding against exploitation. Moreover, the case serves as a chilling reminder of the lengths to which individuals can go in the pursuit of power and the ease with which the line between faith and fanaticism can be blurred. The legacy of the Blackburn cult is not merely one of crime and punishment, but a cautionary tale about the dark corners of the human psyche and the eternal quest for meaning beyond the material world. As we step back into the light from the shadows cast by this tale, we are left with more than just a story of a cult and its crimes. We are reminded of the enduring mysteries of the human heart and the delicate balance between belief and deception, hope and despair. The Blackburn cult in its rise and fall offers a mirror to our deepest fears and highest aspirations, challenging us to reflect on the power of faith and the price of folly.
In the late 20th century, a chilling narrative unfolded that would etch the name of the Order of the Solar Temple into the annals of infamy. This tale of mysticism, manipulation, and mass death begins with the charismatic figures of Luc Jure and Joseph de Mambro. Jure, a homeopathic doctor and lecturer on New Age philosophies, and de Mambro, a man deeply involved in esoteric societies, founded the order in the 1980s. Their proclaimed mission was to prepare for the second coming of Christ as a solar god and to transit humanity to a new age of understanding and peace. However, beneath this veneer of spiritual enlightenment lurked a dark and twisted ideology. The order attracted followers from across Europe and Canada, individuals seeking purpose and meaning in a rapidly changing world. They were drawn to the order's blend of Christian mysticism conspiracy theories and apocalyptic predictions. Members were initiated through elaborate ceremonies designed to simulate death and rebirth, binding them closer to the group's leaders and its secretive doctrines. As the 1990s dawned, the Order's practices began to take a sinister turn under the dual leadership of Jure and de Mumbro. The latter asserted control through psychological manipulation and claims of divine authority, alleging that he was one of the 33 masters of the temple, a reincarnated body of a 14th century Christian. Di Mambro also manipulated members with claims that his daughter, Emmanuel, was the cosmic child destined to lead humanity into a new era. Financial exploitation became rampant within the group with members encouraged to donate vast sums of money to ensure their spiritual salvation and progression within the Order's ranks. This financial and psychological control was compounded by increasingly apocalyptic teachings, suggesting that the world was on the cusp of a catastrophic event from which only the Order's members would be saved. By the early 1990s, cracks began to appear within the organization. Allegations of abuse, financial misconduct and disillusionment among members started to surface, challenging the authority of Jure and de Mambro. Yet the Order's leaders maintained a tight grip on their followers, steering the group towards a tragic and horrifying climax that few could have predicted. As the twilight of the 20th century neared, the Order of the Solar Temple found itself descending into an abyss of its own making, a darkened path lined with the echoes of apocalypse and rebirth. Luc Jure, the enigmatic prophet at the helm, wielded his charisma like a dark lantern, illuminating the fears and hopes of his followers with visions of environmental collapse and spiritual awakening. Yet beneath the surface of his mesmerizing sermons on transcendence, there brewed an ominous fixation with the macabre gateway he claimed death offered a portal to a higher existence beyond the mortal coil. Joseph de Mambro, Jure's counterpart in this grim dance, saw his control tighten like a noose. His regime, marked by erratic demands and an iron grip on the wills of those within the inner sanctum, spiralled into tyranny. Allegations of psychological torment and manipulation seeped through the cracks of the Order's façade painting a portrait of a man who had lost sight of the boundary between divine leadership and despotic rule. This duo's narrative, interwoven with doctrines of a great journey into the afterlife, promised salvation from a world they deemed beyond redemption, painting their departure as an escape from the clutches of a society they viewed as corrupted to its core. The harrowing climax of their tale unfurled in October 1994, a nightmare that would etch the order into the annals of infamy. Across the expanse of two continents, 53 souls were claimed in a maelstrom of fire and poison, a mass sacrifice orchestrated with chilling precision. In the serene Swiss villages of Chiri and Granges sur Salvan, chalets became tombs. Here, the deceased were discovered in a spectral arrangement, donned in ceremonial attire, 
encircling the remnants of a ritual pyre, a tableau that whispered of ancient rites resurrected for a macabre purpose. The methodical nature of the deaths, a horrifying amalgam of executions, poisonings and immolations, spoke of a descent into a madness cloaked in the guise of sanctity. Further tragedy was unveiled in Moran Heights, Quebec, where the grim spectacle was mirrored. Among the deceased were de Mambro and his wife, their demise sealing the fate of the order in a final, gruesome act. This tableau bore the sinister imprint of a pact with eternity, a covenant sealed in the belief of their ascension to a realm beyond the pale of mortal comprehension. Eventually, the veil was lifted on a labyrinth of deceit, revealing a foundation built on financial exploitation and psychological abuse. The investigations, unravelling the threads of this tragedy, exposed a cult enshrouded in the darkness of its leader's ambitions. Former members, now unshackled from the chains of their devotion, and grieving families offered testimonies of a world dominated by fear, manipulation, and the ultimate betrayal of trust. They painted a vivid portrait of a community ensnared by the siren call of Jure and Dimambro, prophets of doom who led their followers not to the promised sanctuary of a new dawn, but to the precipice of an abyss from which there was no return. The aftermath of the tragedy left a world grappling with questions about belief, manipulation and the nature of cults. The mass deaths associated with the Order of the Solar Temple were not the final chapter in its dark history. In December 1995 and March 1997, more members took their lives in France and Quebec, believing in their transcendence to a higher spiritual plane. These subsequent deaths reinforced the depth of the indoctrination Jure and Di Mambro had instilled in their followers, a belief system so strong that it survived even their own deaths. The investigations revealed a tangled network of financial fraud, with millions of dollars unaccounted for, suggesting that the leaders had exploited their followers' wealth as much as their faith. Families of the victims were left to mourn, their grief compounded by the bewildering realisation that their loved ones had been ensnared in a deadly pact they could scarcely understand. The public and media fascination with the case brought the dangers of cult dynamics into sharp relief, highlighting how charismatic leaders could exploit spiritual seeking for nefarious ends. The Order of the Solar Temple became a case study in the psychology of cults with experts analysing how the group's blend of Christian mysticism, New Age beliefs and conspiracy theories could lead to such a tragic outcome. Reflecting on the legacy of the Order, it's clear that the allure of belonging, the search for meaning and the desire for a transcendent purpose can sometimes lead individuals down dark paths. The case serves as a stark reminder of the potential dangers of unquestioned allegiance to charismatic leaders and the importance of critical thinking and autonomy in spiritual pursuits. As the world moves further into the 21st century, the lessons of the Order of the Solar Temple remain relevant. In an age of rapid information and evolving spiritual landscapes, the tragedy underscores the need for vigilance against the darker aspects of human nature and belief. It's a cautionary tale of how the quest for spiritual enlightenment can sometimes lead to destruction, but also a reminder of the resilience of those who seek to understand and prevent such tragedies in the future. The Order of the Solar Temple's story is a chilling testament to the complexities of faith, power and the human desire for connection. It challenges us to reflect on the nature of belief and the lengths to which individuals will go to achieve salvation, both in this world and beyond. <laughs>